Hi, good morning. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I'm a PhD student at VIMS with Dr. Mary Fabrizio, and the focus of my research is on the condition of juvenile fish in Virginia estuary for three species, the summer flounder, striped bass, and Atlantic croaker. Today I'll only be focusing on flounder and croaker, so if you're interested in striped bass, please talk to me later today. I chose these three species because they are important for commercial and recreational fisheries both in Virginia as well as much of the mid-Atlantic coast. In Virginia, the commercial fisheries have harvested 5 to 13 million pounds of croaker every year since 2000, with up to 4 million pounds of flounder being harvested each year as well. So we are removing a large number of adult fish due to fishing, and these adult fish need to be replaced by younger individuals. Here, I'll walk you through the life cycle of Atlantic croaker. Note that flounder are quite similar to this. The adults spawn on the continental shelf, and the tides bring the larvae into Chesapeake Bay, where they feed and grow into juvenile fish. The adults also return to feed in the productive waters of the bay, and that's where most of the fishing occurs. Eventually, the juveniles mature and join the adults to spawn on the shelf. The process of the juvenile surviving and entering into the uh, adult stage is often called recruitment, and this is what offsets the removal of adults due to fishing. So those two need to be equal if fishing is going to be sustainable. And fisheries managers actually use estimates of recruitment in their stock assessments to manage for sustainability. However, recruitment can be quite variable. It changes a lot because it depends on factors such as food availability and habitat quality. Currently, our estimates of recruitment are based solely on the number or abundance of those juvenile fishes. This implies that all the fish are equally likely to survive to adulthood, and that may not necessarily be true. At times when food availability is low or there may be poor habitat quality, it's probably only the healthiest juveniles that actually end up surviving. So it may be best to base our estimates of recruitment on those healthy juveniles. And that's one of the objectives of my research, to see if we can use fishing condition to make our recruitment estimates more accurate. But in order to do so, we have to answer two questions. First, how can we measure condition for these species? Fishery scientists have developed uh, a large number of condition indices, but they don't necessarily work equally well for every species. So we need to find out what works for juvenile croaker and flounder. Once we do that, we can look at the second question, when and where are these fish the healthiest? Condition in juveniles changes throughout the year. If we end up counting those fish for estimates of recruitment when they're in poor condition, we may be overestimating it because those poor conditioned fish may die before reaching adulthood. Similarly, not all areas are created equally, so we should probably focus our recruitment estimates on those areas that produce healthier fish that are likely to survive. For that first question, how do we measure condition? Ideally, we would use energy, because it's energy that actually determines survival. Normally, we would measure energy through an approach called bomb calorimetry. Unfortunately, calorimetry is a slow and somewhat costly process, so we really need something that's a bit more rapid to look at a large number of fish. So I've investigated several common measurements that are typically used to measure fish health, and I compared them to estimates of energy. Today, I'll be focusing on two of those. First, heavier fish at a given length are thought to be in better condition. So we took length to weight ratios for a measurement called Fulton's Condition Factor, or K. And it turns out that K does a good job of predicting energy content for summer flounder. We also looked at fat content, because fats contain a lot of energy and are important for survival. Some species store fats under their skin, so we used a piece of technology called the Distel Fish Fat Meter, which is shown in that picture, because the fat meter uses microwaves to measure that amount of fat stored underneath the skin. And it turns out that the fat meter does a good job at predicting energy for Atlantic croaker. So using these two measurements, we can then go out and look at trends and condition throughout the year in Virginia waters. In order to do that, we took many samples from random locations throughout Chesapeake Bay using the Juvenile Fish Trawl Survey at FIMS. 
We collected samples from two regions in the James River, York River, and Rappahannock Rivers, from three regions in the Chesapeake Bay, and we also collected fish from Oyster, Virginia, the coastal lagoons on the eastern shore. To look at some of the results from this effort, here for summer flounder, we see trends in condition throughout the year determined by those length to weight ratios from 2010 to 2012. Those dashed lines highlight the average condition each year, and we found that condition was very similar between 2010 and 2011. However, the condition of flounder in 2012 was statistically lower than the other years. And that's really interesting because 2012 showed us the highest abundance of juvenile summer flounder in the bay that we've seen since 1994. Here I've highlighted the months used to measure recruitment for this species. And as you can see, condition seems to decline through the year and is actually near its lowest when we measure condition uh, for our recruitment estimate or when we measure our recruitment estimates. Then uh, when the healthier fish migrate, uh, sorry, when fish migrate out of the bay, only the healthy fish are left that are able to remain and survive in the bay over the winter. Moving on to some of the spatial trends, uh, here we see how healthy summer flounder are in different parts of the bay based on those length to weight ratios. When we modeled this data, the biggest finding that we came across was that condition differed most among the individuals, which means that we were catching both high and low condition flounder in the exact same locations. However, as you can see, there are trends in condition. The red denotes high condition and the blue denotes low condition. Those healthier fish we found in Oyster, Virginia and in parts of the James River. Whereas low condition flounder were found in the <coughs> upper and lower bay regions. Those red and blue dots that you see really just highlight the differences in condition among specific sampling locations. Moving on to Atlantic Croker, here we see trends in condition through time as measured by the fat meter. Again, the dashed lines show the average condition each year, and we didn't see any differences in croaker condition. Here I've highlighted the months used to estimate recruitment for croaker, and opposite of what we saw in flounder, condition seems to increase through the summer and is highest at fall. Then, the healthiest fish migrate out of the bay, so only the poor condition fish are left over winter, and that's statistically lower. Looking at some of the spatial trends, again, the red denotes locations with higher condition, and blue denotes locations with lower condition based on the fat meter readings. When modeling this data, like flounder, we found that there was some uh, condition differed the most at the individual level. So we were catching high and low condition croaker in the exact same locations as well. We do see some trends across the regions with the upper and middle bay region producing croaker in the highest condition, whereas the James River and the lower bay had croaker in low condition. And again, we still see those red and blue dots that highlight uh, the differences among our sampling locations. So in summary, given these trends and conditions that we just saw, it may be possible for us to use condition to improve our estimates of recruitment. We could do so by using condition to hopefully inform the selection of months and areas uh, on which our recruitment estimates are based, which again ultimately get used in stock assessments and go into the management of these species. For example, we saw that summer flounder condition differed among years. So we may actually expect lower recruitment from the 2012 year class because those individuals were in quite low condition despite the high abundance that we saw. We also noted seasonal trends in condition for both species. Croaker condition seemed to increase through the summer, so it may be best to focus our recruitment estimates towards the end of that time period when most of the fish are healthy and likely to survive. Whereas summer flounder showed the opposite trends, their condition declined through the summer, and again, was remember, it was lowest when we were measuring condition. So we may be overestimating recruitment if those poor condition flounder succumb to mortality before they enter the adult stage. And finally, when we were looking at the spatial patterns and condition, 
we found that condition differed most among individual fish. And this means that it's individual traits like feeding success that may ultimately uh, depict survival and thus recruitment. However, as you saw, we did see condition trends among different areas of the bay. Some had higher condition than others. For summer flounder, the high condition fish were seen in oyster and in the James River. Whereas for Atlantic croaker, the higher condition fish were seen in the upper and middle bay regions. So those areas might have good habitat that support croaker and flounder in healthier condition. So we may want to base our recruitment estimates in those areas. And with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources, particularly for Virginia Sea Grant for bringing us all here today. And of course, a thank you to the many, many individuals that collected samples for this research. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we are looking into that. We collect environmental data at all the locations from which we collect fish. So we have temperature and salinity and dissolved oxygen from these areas. We have begun to look at it, and it seems like salinity may be important for summer flounder. It's hard to tell how much the healthy fish in Oyster, Virginia, are kind of biasing that. But there is some lower condition further upriver. So I think salinity is important for flounder, but we're still kind of teasing out the fine differences in that information. Um, you're looking at these differences even in the area loss of control, like the density of the fish in this area. I mean, wouldn't those be inversely related? Yes, and, and we, we would expect that with higher abundance, you have more, uh, if there's limited food resources, it's going to be spread apart, and the, ultimately the condition is going to be lower for those individuals. We have that information similar to the temperature and salinity. We're, we're bringing that into some of our models to help predict condition in these areas, but uh, we haven't got the results finalized for that. But we are looking into it. We expect to see trends with density. Yes. So I guess sort of a related question. So you, you showed the distrib you showed the condition at a lot of open water sites. What what percentage of these juvenile populations are in the open water sites versus the really shallow fringes that aren't maybe not I'm not sure if they were represented on your map or not, but really shallow water. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a good that's a good question. We do randomly select the stations in these areas, so whether they're in the open water or shallow it kind of depends on the randomness. Uh, we do collect these individuals throughout the entire area, whether they're more densely packed in one spot than another. I, I don't have that data with me right now, and I don't remember off the top of my head. But we collect, obviously we collect fish throughout the entire bay, whether it's open or uh, along the shore. Uh, just, I don't know the exact ratios. One more. Uh, one more question. The, uh, your feeding success you talked about a little bit. Is there a way mm -hmm. to measure that, whether they're in groups, whether they feed in groups, whether they feed individually? I didn't know if that was something that would affect your it may be possible to look into that. Unfortunately, one of the best ways to look at whether they're feeding is sacrificing the fish. And one of the objectives of this research is try to look at condition without sacrificing uh, because we're trying to look at a large number of fish. So we don't really want to be removing too many individuals. It'd be a really interesting thing to do, uh, but we haven't gotten there yet. And another issue is just because they're feeding, it takes a little while for those nutrients that they've, they've consumed to be integrated into the system. So, I'm, so there might be a little, little latency in, in trying to relate those two measures that, that could complicate that. Uh, but we haven't looked into it yet. Thank you, Thank you very much.